welcome to the FanDuel TV studios. Once again, with you here for Wired to Wire, I'm Christina Blacker, joined by the Sarge Nick Hines. It is fall championship season, and the My Race Horse team is headed to the Breeders' Cup. No, oh, absolutely. No better time than now. And of course, uh, in the words of Earth, Wind, and Fire, do you remember? September and uh, dancing, of course, chasing the clouds away. That's kind of how we felt, uh, Christina, and certainly the march to the uh, opening weekend there in November. Breeders' Cup Championships, and of course, uh, speaking in particular to going to Vegas, who once again hit the jackpot defending her crown in the uh, Rodale Drive there at the Great Race Place. We'll get to her in just a little bit. I'm going to apologize right now for my voice. I sound worse than I feel. I'm very excited to be with you here this morning once again, and we have quite a few races to recap, some big wins to recap, and some stakes victories to recap as well. Let's start with Duke of Love. Duke of Love, big victory, a couple starts back. This was at Fort Erie in the Prince of Wales Stakes, and this is part of the Canadian Triple Crown. Yeah, what a, a fun opportunity this has turned out to be. He's earned four times his original purchase price, and uh, a horse that uh, essentially ran in each leg of the uh, Canadian Triple Crown, and Josie Carroll has done a tremendous job with this son of a Cupid with a tip of the cap to uh, Phil Hager, also scouting there at the uh, Phasic uh, Timonium Sale in May of his two-year-old year, certainly uh, an up-and-comer. Uh, your third Prince of Wales uh, with Duke of Love. Just tell us how you feel right now. You know what, it's a feeling that never gets old. Uh, I would say this horse was particularly rewarding because he's been a, a little bit of a challenge. You know, he was a bit of an immature horse that took a while to figure it out, and he sure put it together on the right day. Josie's done such a great job with Duke of Love. Excited to see that big win for him. Well, absolutely. For a horse that's uh, won a third of his career starts, he did come back subsequently to compete uh, in that third leg of the Canadian Triple Crown. Coming off a career best, 87 buyers. Speed figure things didn't quite go as expected. He'll get a little uh, deserved uh, vacation here uh, into the winter months. But uh, looking forward to a horse that I feel is only getting better and developing both mentally and physically. Josie, tremendous job with a horse that uh, certainly earned uh, the right to be a good one. That win came on September the 13th, which was a very good day. We had another win on September the 13th, this time Carruthers. Carruthers with a victory against Allowance Company at Presque Isle. He'll end up getting this one by about a length. Yeah, it's certainly another horse that it's taken time to kind of uh, figure him out uh, per se. But uh, Kent Sweezy, that's two wins uh, in the Kent Sweezy barn. Something this horse hadn't been able to do stateside. Congrats going out to our partners medallion, Phil Shelton, Parkland Thoroughbreds, and to Edward Kelly. Just want to say congratulations on Carruthers. He ran an awesome race. Um, he's come back good so far. Um, I'll hear from the jockey here in a little bit, but uh, he did everything right. He didn't break great for us, but uh, that actually might have played out in our favor, knowing how, how tricky he can be. Um, it was um, maybe a blessing in disguise that he didn't have any horses around him and could kind of settle, and um, he made a great move. And, um, yeah, the jock rode him great, and uh, he ran awesome. So congrats, guys, and uh, thanks very much. Go Carruthers. We love that here, especially with Matt Carruthers, who we think of every time Carruthers wins. A couple of wins for him on synthetic there. He's definitely found his preferred surface, it looks like, Sarge. And I love looking at his form because he doesn't necessarily need to take his track with him. He's competed so many different places. He travels well, and he seems like he's getting better right now. Well, and I, I love the fact that uh, Ken Sweezy, you know, not, not a household name yet, uh, obviously, from a limited opportunity here with my racehorse, he's done a tremendous job and kind of just uh, being able to kind of figure the uh, individual out athlete out. There's no doubt that uh, Carruthers has the uh, underlying ability. It's just a matter of getting him to uh, go out there and perform, as we saw there with that uh, victory at uh, Presque Isle and major props. Again, patient uh, partners uh, paying it forward. This next filly has come a long way. Quite the journey with 63 caliber. She is now a four-time winner and a stakes-winning daughter of Gunrunner. Yeah, well, 63 caliber, she has certainly uh, kind of risen to I guess a partner favorite. Uh, this was a race in which she was able to produce her career best buyer speed figure and getting her first ever stakes victory in the Seneca. And uh, this was a, uh, once again, tribute to uh, Tom Amos. Tremendous training job and a congrats going out to our partners in Spendthrift Farms.
that's hard. Gotta love that. Passing the trophy around, Tommy Miss getting everybody fired up with 63 caliber with that big victory and sharing all the trophy pictures, I'm sure. Hopefully bringing some more people and you see that kind of stuff on social media makes you want to be a part of it. Right, so many familiar faces, but that truly is what it's all about. Uh, it's about you, the uh, partner, the owner, uh, and of course the shareholders uh, in the process. I think the one thing that impressed me the most about her, you know, this is a, a filly that uh, had had a throat issue and uh, had a throat surgery as a result. So there was some kind of trepidation as to whether or not how is she going to progress? How is she going to move forward? But you take one look at her career mark. She's won four of six. She's nearly attained or at least close to 65, 70% of her original purchase price at Keeneland September. She already banked 173,000, but getting that first stakes victory, not only means so much in the grand scheme of things, but to her individually, residually, uh, that's a major plus. But to Tom Amos, I salute you, sir. Tremendous work with uh, a filly that uh, could be any kind at and this how rate. how good is Gunrunner? I mean, having a stakes-winning daughter oh, of Gunrunner is an oh, exciting absolutely. opportunity. Oh, yeah. This is a good time, fun time for 63 caliber. How about another one? Let's move forward to another victory. This time, Rosie's Alibi. Able to get the win in her second career start. A little frustrating in her debut in Saratoga, but there were high hopes for the daughter of Justify, and she put it all together at Parks. Well, she put it all together, and this was uh, on Pennsylvania Bread Day, and obviously an opportunity to go out there and, and highlight uh, her, her natural ability. I mean, she debuted, you know, kind of climbing a bit, a bit green uh, in performance, but, you know, as a horse that was purchased as a yearling last year, and a high dollar one at that, but a tremendous year for Justify, this was nice to see. All right, uh, you just were aboard Rosie uh, when she broke for Maiden. Just bring us to the trip. Uh, she was really good. Uh, put me in a good spot early on the race. Uh, I helped him out of there. I was able to see second. Then a lot of horse came in, came in, get close to me, inside of me. I see third in the clear, wait my time. Uh, three, four, quarter, four. I started letting do her team, asking a little bit, and she opened up right away. She was there for me. No, it was just her second start. Um, down the stretch, did you feel like she, she might have still been a little bit green, or do you think she's all right? Yeah, she's all right. Uh, she made the lead kind of made, made the lead kind of like wait a little bit on horses, run a little bit. And I hit a couple of times. She responded well, so put the stick down, let her like and she just back up too quick. So I have to call her attention again, getting close to the way, and she responded really well. So I like that. I'm happy with her. Great. Thank Really teaching you something a little bit there from Ira Ortiz and just kind of exemplifying how the horses are learning as well mm -hmm. throughout the race. Even though this was a big victory for her by over five lengths, she learned a lot. Oh, absolutely. And I think you go back to the debut and she was ridden that day by Luis Saez. He did the right thing on that particular day to essentially take care of her. But as mentioned, she was a bit green, kind of climbing and, and just couldn't necessarily fall into her stride. But the one thing I can truly appreciate is the fact that trainer Todd Pletcher, he stayed the course, found the perfect spot in the condition book. Props to our uh, West, our East Coast uh, racing manager liaison, uh, Harry Rice. Turned out to be a nice day. Nice purse, 61000 Looks like October 26th, an allowance event for her most likely. She is Pennsylvania bred, so definitely uh, could see her back at parks. And remember, she's part of the Phasic Tipton Select 6 bonus, so that's some excitement to look forward to into next year. Another winner came from Psychedelic Shack. Psychedelic Shack most recently at Delaware, a 76 buyer for this effort for Christophe Clement. Well, Psychedelic Shack, a horse that uh, during the uh, pandemic year when they pushed the uh, two-year-old sales back, uh, had the uh, fastest gallop out time for that particular sale. So this is really nice to see and uh, love the fact that uh, Christophe Clement has essentially allowed uh, Psychedelic Shack to, to find his own. He's lightly raced. Now to date, he's had uh, four tries, earned a near career best uh, buyer figure of a uh, 76 and uh, still in tax son of a Shackleford out of the more than ready mare uh, Capri song. But uh, you know, again, I think the idea with Psychedelic Shack, he still has some conditions to work with. Uh, he's obviously very quick and uh, somewhat one-dimensional, but certainly a horse that I think at some point, uh, I think he could go back to the uh, the main track and find his presence felt. Never raced on the main track, but certainly a horse. Now that he's figuring things out, the talent is indeed there. Once again, congrats to the partners. Uh, your patience paying it forward. Bit of a confusing condition. He was not claimed that day. Bit of a confidence booster, that win. So looking forward to what is next 
for Psychedelic Shack. For our next recap, I feel like I'm experiencing deja vu. It happened again. Going to Vegas wins the Rodeo Drive at Santa Anita in gate to wire fashion. Well, this was especially nice to see for going to Vegas, who uh, was able to step up and defend her crown. What can you say? I mean, even uh, the former trainer, Richard Baltus, who for his group at that time claimed her for just $50,000, able to bounce back off of kind of a head scratching, disappointing effort in the grade two, John. Maybe she defends her crown. She stamps her ticket right back to the Breeders' Cup Championships. We were going to Vegas uh, right after winning the Grade One Rodeo Drive, back-to-back -back wins in this race. As you can see, she's happy, looking for carrots. A uh, pretty exciting race. Everything kind of went her way. She got to the front end like we all hoped, uh, and she showed uh, her talent and ability again. So uh, we're excited to get back to Kentucky, have redemption in the Breeders' Cup, and just want to say congratulations to all the owners. She's always been one of my favorites. She's so determined. She's so fast. I actually picked her last year on top in the Philly and Mare turf at Del Mar. Let's see how her training progresses. Definitely looking forward to seeing going to Vegas back at the Breeders' Cup. She has some redemption sort of hopefully on her hands, right? She came in in such good form last year. Let's see if she can do it this year. Well, and again, this will be her, her swan song and uh, major uh, credit going out to Phil D'Amato. Not an easy thing to do to take over a filly kind of in flux uh, as she was, but Phil has done a tremendous job uh, with this daughter of Golden Sense who stands at uh, Spendthrift Farm. Major congrats going out to the partnership. Abadanza, Bing Bush, Medallion, Phil Shelton. But uh, she's roughly... She is $849 away from becoming racing's newest millionaire. So let's hope she gets to the starting gate for the Breeders' Cup of Philly Mare Turf. And then, of course, she'll enter into the November, November Night of Stars there at uh, Phasing. And I'm sure the ticket uh, will be uh, phenomenal. This is kind of the, the perfect journey, if you will. When you go in, you buy a, a Philly or a Mare that certainly has some credential. For her to do what she's done, get multiple grade one victories as she has done for uh, Team My Racehorse. It certainly uh, goes a long way, and uh, we wish her well. I'm looking forward to seeing her race uh, there at Keeneland. She takes so many people on the journey as well with all the partnerships. So bravo going to Vegas, another grade one victory on her resume. Those are our victories. We're going to transition now to the breaking process, which is something that, as you can imagine, is quite lengthy. You're trying to take a horse that's out there running around in the field and turn them into a racehorse. Luckily for us, Kieran Dunn of Wave Tree is taking us through just one step of that lengthy process today. Take a look. After the initial phase of just getting to know them, getting them to listen to voice commands, stage two will be the introduction of a roller. Um, you know, this is important when we want them to listen. We want them to, you know, be able to stand and behave. So what we try and do is just work, work it around them. Let them feel it on their belly. Just tighten it with your hand gently. Put the pressure there. Walk up a step. Walk up a step. There you go. One more. One more. There you go. As you can see, he's just a little touchy and tight because it's an unnatural feeling for him when he feels that tightness around him when he walks. There's a lot more where that came from as well. Kieran is currently working with Patsy's Kim 21 and Smart Shopping 21. You can definitely get involved with those two horses if you'd like to receive weekly updates in terms of that process there at Wavertree. So thanks to Kieran Dunn. One of the uh, most well-known horsemen in the game, certainly out there in Ocala, Sargento, everybody I think here in Southern California, all across the country has done some work with him over the years. Just a great eye for a horse and clearly uh, does such a nice job in that process. Yeah, no doubt. And I think the one thing you can appreciate is uh, Kieran Dunn's range. Obviously one that also uh, consigns for uh, two-year-olds and does a, a wonderful job uh, from a pin-hooking perspective. But he's a consummate horseman. Uh, obviously daughter Caitlin is uh, a, a major force here with uh, my race 
resource with our events and such, but uh, it's nice to have Kieran Dunn as part of the uh, makeup of my racehorse. But you have to appreciate the process. I mean, we, we talked, to, for example, about going to Vegas, a horse of racing age you purchased uh, in that uh, process of being in running mode. But when you get these youngsters, it's especially nice to see the day-to-day, -day, the ins and outs, and how these horses come along. And it's so important, those lessons, that foundation that he's building is what not only is going to enable them to be their best selves out on the racetrack, but also to keep everybody safe. Mm. You know, those are those first early lessons that have to be taught properly so that when they do come to the racetrack, it's a big, new, overwhelming world. They need to have each one of those bricks kind of laid in place to be able to handle the new experiences. Oh, absolutely. Foundation is everything, much like uh, your children uh, when they're young, developing, and uh, not only from a physical standpoint, but the mental as well. Well done uh, to that, and looking forward to those updates as those youngsters uh, develop into their uh, young careers. Let's take a look at the work of the month. We're going to focus in on a son of McLean's music. This is Magical Ways, a five furlong gate drill, 59 flat, Earned the bullet, best of 36. It's the bay on the inside of this pair. And I'll tell you, Bill Mott's not often looking for the bullet work. This is a very impressive drill from this horse. Well, the horse that was purchased out of a uh, two-year-old training uh, sale, OBS April of 2021, uh, for a, a fairly significant sum in a, a, sum in a partnership with uh, Saratoga 7. It's nice to see that uh, now we've found some rhythm and uh, this horse uh, working on point. And you see the updated workout here, 59 seconds flat, best of 36 in that Belmont morning. Looking forward to hopefully seeing him sometime this month. Remember in New York, they are racing the Belmont meet at Aqueduct. So Belmont at the Big A, he's three years old. We've had to be patient as we talk about all the time here. But those little issues that he's had along the way are behind him. Excited to see him run magical ways with a nice bullet work, most recently for Bill Mott. Time for our stable spotlights now. We both have one to share with you once again this month. I'm going to focus in on Kenthari. Here's a two-year-old colt that was an OBS March purchase. He was a $525,000 purchase. But boy, has this been a journey. And what we're celebrating today is the fact that he has made it to Todd Pletcher's barn. I feel like we could actually do an entire show on Kanthari if we wanted to. Those setbacks just kind of kept on coming. He had kissing spine disorder back in the fall of 2021. And if you weren't along for the journey at that point, that's basically when the vertebrae in their back are just a little bit too close together. He then ended up having to have tie back surgery in June of this year. He had his vocal cords removed at one point. This horse has been through a lot, but he's been a great patient through it all and he is now in Todd Pletcher's barn. There are still quite a few steps that need to be you know, accomplished before we get to a race, but he's at Churchill Downs and he is under the watchful eye of the Hall of Famer. So if you have been patiently waiting for Kanthari, uh, I know you've learned a lot through this journey, but thank you for the patience and let's uh, hope he gets to the races very soon. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I think we, we go back and we talk about 63 Caliber, for example, who was able to overcome a throat surgery that in, in many sense of the word you hope that they can go out and be competitive but i i think in the case of her she's obviously proved that she has the will grit and desire to do just that kanthari $575,000 two-year-old training purchase in a partnership at the time there with the spendthrift certainly a horse that uh, there are high hopes he's a big individual certainly it uh, gives uh, plenty of presence and he is so sweet and kind i remember being at the sale he just basically landed on just about every short list we had so let's hope uh, with the pages of you uh partners that uh, kanthari will get himself back into the rhythm and to find himself in a starting gate before too long with trainer todd pletcher more updates to come from todd pletcher he is at the barn at churchill downs all right your stable spotlight is a horse that i've always been very excited about straight no chaser well, as far as uh, my stable spotlight, uh, this one will probably fall near and dear to your heart, uh, Christina. With straight, no chaser, a horse that uh, certainly gave us uh, oohs and ahs off of a kind of a awe-inspiring debut down at the Seaside Oval. Unfortunately, came back, was not able to frank that form, but uh, he did have an underlying excuse, as many horses uh, do, uh, obviously, in transit and when they stable at Del Mar. These young horses, they, they tend to get a little viral deal from time to time, but just a bit under the weather, if you will. But he was able to recover, but his effort, uh, disappointing, uh, to say the least. Good news, came back. Uh, Dan went over with a fine tooth comb. Straight no chaser is back on point, and uh, I'm sure you're right there, and you're hearing uh, close and personal how he's doing, Christina. Yeah, the works have been very good. I was actually uh, out yesterday morning as well and able to see him out on the racetrack. And what I like about what we're seeing from him is he's putting that 
same enthusiasm into his training mm -hmm. that he did going into the debut. He's a horse that just does everything so easily and so effortlessly on his own. And he's just naturally so fast. He's showing that again. Oh, absolutely, and that's great to see. You know, you get a little concerned when they they finish last uh, off of a, uh, a debut victory. But as I was saying, underlying excuse, he's come back with a pair of five, 59 and change uh, five panel spins. Uh, let's listen in to a trainer, Dan Blacker, some insight on straight no chasing. His energy's picked up now. His weight looks good. He's got real enthusiasm for his training. Uh, had a very strong work at the weekend, worked a solo, 5.8 in 59, galloped out in 112. My assistant was on him and said he did it in hand the whole way, he looked very, very strong. Uh, so obviously, you know, he's always been a good workhorse, this guy, but I just really love the way he did that visually. It was a very uh, strong work as well as, as the time, obviously. Um, I've always wanted to run this horse on the dirt and he, he's always, been a great workhorse on the main track, so I think uh, I think we should point him for a dirt race coming up at San Anita on October 29th, going six and a half. It's an allowance. I think that'd be a great spot for him. So he'd have two works between now and then. So I'll keep you posted with his progress up until that point. Thanks. Looking forward to that dirt race and to seeing what he can do. He clearly trains just fine on the main track. Yeah, and a big thank you to uh, Dan. And, it, you know, the one thing we can appreciate at My Racehorse is when, you know, while we recommend trainers to try and give us uh, content, this was unsolicited. It's nice to show up uh, on the email and, of course, an update. Our West Coast Racing Manager, Joe Moran, is on hand virtually every day out there at uh, Santa Anita. But to hear it directly from a trainer's perspective, just on a mosey up to the, uh, the main track, is a, a true positive. So let's hope uh, October 29th is a winning one and uh, one for straight no chase to get back on the beam. I'm excited. Another horse that was purchased out of the uh, Timonium May sale of last year, same sale that uh, Duke of Love came out of. So two very nice prospects uh, with a promising future. We've talked a little bit throughout the show about horses that have needed time off for one reason or another. Uh, to expand on that a little bit more, we have a video for you here from Dr. Burke. Take a look. Training is a continuous series of days where you're actually putting physical activity into something to build muscle, to build bone, to build ligament and tendon, to strengthen all those structures. And when you are training, there's a, what's actually happening is you're causing stress and strain on these structures that within normal limits is what is needed for things to get stronger. There comes a time though, when a horse reaches uh, a level of fitness and beyond which excessive training and, or excessive racing can actually be damaging to the individual. And so I think part of the art of training and hopefully as an assistance, the art of veterinary medicine when we're trying to help trainers is for us to all determine at what point the horse has reached a, a peak level of fitness uh, beyond which uh, excessive training may be damaging. Every horse needs some time off at some point. I think the real skill involved is determining at what point that is. And so what are the things that we look for to tell us when a horse needs some time off? That was just a clip from the video from Dr. Burke. You can watch the full show on the My Race Horse YouTube channel if you'd like to dive into more information. I love how he explains everything and just kind of breaks it all down for you. Yeah, Dr. Burke, uh, one of the best in the game as far as uh, giving you that uh, insight and perspective. Obviously, not only here uh, domestically, but internationally, he is a veterinarian that uh, attends uh, sales does pre-purchase exams, but on a day-to-day, -day, daily basis with my racehorse, able to give us some perspective when a problem or an issue were to come up. But it's always nice to have kind of a team doctor, if you will, mm -hmm. but uh, Dr. Burke, so eloquent uh, in speech and one to essentially convey what the future may hold. I mean, unfortunately, with track veterinarians or veterinarians these days, um, some may look for the crystal ball. Mm -hmm. They do their best in telling us what potentially may happen, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it's nice to have a guy like Dr. Burke on the My Race Horse team. Tremendous. I would advise each and every one of you to take a look at that there on the YouTube channel, My Race Horse. Thanks once again to Dr. Burke for that video. Time for our racing lingo, racing jargon term 
of the month, and this is with regard to breeding and to breeding contracts. Sarge, how would you explain this, both uh, stands and nurses and the live full guarantee? Well, it's essentially uh, one in the same. Uh, when you essentially set up a, a breeding contract uh, to breed a particular mare, some will go with the no live full guarantee, meaning that uh, you might be able to negotiate. Let's say, for example, you have a stallion whose stud fee might be $50,000, and that stallion may be a little older, and there might be some fertility question. Well, you likely want to get a uh, live full guarantee, stands and nurses uh, stamp on it, but you're going to have to pay, pay a premium. Whereas if you're to say, look, I'm willing to pay half or less than half, then you get a no live full guarantee. So that's basically what that uh, entails. And essentially that fee isn't paid until the next year Correct. when you have proof of that live foal that stands in nurses. It's, it's pretty uh, literal in its terms, right? But Very. you do have to kind of apply that to the contracts and it takes a while, it takes a long time. So it's definitely, as we touch on a lot, the breeding game is a long one and that is one of the ways to ensure that you are safe and you are protected a little bit as you're making that investment. Yeah, and I think it's just a, a horse to horse and a mare to mare and a stallion to stallion basis. I mean, if you have a mare that's been well proven to, uh, you know, get in full or a stallion that's a uh, fertile and uh, being able to, to cover and, and deliver, then you have an opportunity to get there and negotiate. But uh, if there's some question, then you certainly want to get that live full guarantee and stands and nurses. But Spendthrift, uh, they've done a tremendous job over the years about helping the small breeder, you know, as far as their program is concerned. Uh, Breed Secure, for example, is one and for another uh, conversation. But it's tremendous. Yeah, Spendthrift always uh, on the cusp of that and definitely innovating in the breeding world as well. Two horses to highlight for the aftercare spotlight this month. Mo Mischief is the first one we're going to talk about. This is a horse that was with my racehorse way back at the beginning. And thanks in part to his breeder, Carrie Brogdon, they actually reached in and claimed him back for $5,000 back in September. It was off a win. He won that race, but he was immediately retired after the race, and he will have a wonderful second home and second career. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, truly what it's all about. And as we've mentioned uh, on previous shows, uh, bottom line, uh, we obviously uh, take, uh, you know, role in, in trying to land horses uh, safely and soundly. If they were claimed away, uh, we've got all eyes uh, on them. And of course, there's uh, Carrie's daughter, Machmer Hall, who's been uh, kind of a stand up uh, in the top tier in the breeding world. Of course, Carrie Brogdon and her husband, they've uh, obviously been instrumental in uh, providing this type of uh, given situation. But uh, props to uh, the team at uh, My Racehorse for acknowledging the fact that, hey, for a horse that was in for just 5000 maybe it was time to step in and claim. Nice to see he went out a winner. Mo Mischief, he's a young one. He's only four years of age, a son of uh, Into Mischief, but uh, he certainly is going to have a, a tremendous life after racing. And uh, Looks as if he retired sound to boot, so that's uh, great to see. Michael Behrens has made this such a pillar of the My Racehorse organization and definitely followed up on this one. Mm. Carrie Brogdon, you might have seen her actually this week on FanDuel. She bred Gina Romantica, who won the QE2. So you remember the woman that was very emotional. Oh, after yeah, the she's race. emotional. That's Carrie, if you haven't uh, met her yourself. This horse, Mo Mischief, is going to head to the farm of her sister, Christy Wellworth, in Virginia. He will definitely be spoiled and hopefully become a hunter or a show horse in the near future. The other horse to talk about for our aftercare spotlight is Big Mel. Big Mel had a four race career himself, and he, after being retired and moving on to that second career, just experienced his very first trail ride. At New Vocations, they say that he's kind of a playful guy, and he is ready for that second career. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I always appreciated uh, this horse's his mindset. Unfortunately, uh, you know, some physical uh, instabilities uh, kind of kind of precluded his race career. But as you can see now, uh, he's grown up, he's filled out, and uh, he is certainly uh, in his element there. Now at uh, five years of age, seems like it's so long ago uh, <laughs> when these horses were youngsters. Of course, he was uh, in a partnership with Spendthrift at the time there, Bob Baffert training. But to Big Mel, uh, he's a happy horse, and this is something that I think we'll look forward to seeing with uh, Mo Mischief, for example, right. because they personality, just their their soul, uh, they were wired uh, in that same demeanor. Again, it comes down to the fact that uh, I think mentally they were up to stuff being yeah. racehorses, but physically there was just that little underlying denominator which held them back. New Vocations does a wonderful job with all of their retraining, rehoming. You can visit their website if you want more information. He is adoptable for $1,000, Big Mel, so good luck 
to whoever is out there and does end up with him at their home for a second career. Let's take a look at the upcoming races that we have to look forward to, the races that hopefully we are recapping for you on this show next month with a host of winners. Here's what we're looking forward to in the coming weeks. Well, uh, again, it's going to be very difficult to top the month of September, Christina. My racehorse uh, going 7 for 22, winning 33% <laughs> of, of races. But uh, certainly we're up to the task. Certainly can step in. But uh, big uh, salute going out to those competing. Of course, Captain Sparrow, uh, shout out to uh, Joe Moran, managing there, son of Spitestown, purchased uh, out of the uh, Timonium May sale this year. Uh, plenty of upside uh, above suspicion uh, for my racehorse, certainly one that uh, I think can compete and get back uh, on the beam as well. As you take a look at that uh, list, you know, all eyes on championship weekend there at uh, Keeneland uh, with going to Vegas. Reader's Cup weekend is going to be busy with going to Vegas and definitely at Santa Anita. Looks like Richard Mandela might be running all of the My Race Horse horses in one weekend. <laughs> That's going to be a good one <laughs> yes. to look forward to as well. So if you can't be in Kentucky, come out here to Southern California. That will do it for us this month. Sarge, as always, it was a pleasure. That's a pleasure. Christina, you, thank you, and uh, you're great as always. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see you guys next month here on Wire to Wire. Good luck at the races to the entire team of My Racehorse Partners. We'll see you next time.